Hi, I'm Jim. And I'm David. And And this this is the Practical Practical Guitarist Guitarist Podcast. Podcast. The podcast for people who eat, sleep, and breathe guitar. Practical Guitarist Podcast is brought to you by Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Great Lakes Guitar Pickups provides fantasy tones at prices a practical guitarist will love. Featuring top-notch construction, attention to detail, and a fully custom product, if you can dream it, Great Lakes Guitar Pickups can probably build it. Follow them on Facebook at facebook.com slash Great Lakes Guitar Pickups. Are you a regular listener? Why not? David here reminding you of all the ways you can participate in the Practical Guitarist Podcast. Subscribe using your chosen podcast app. Review us on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or Google Play. Find our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Practical Guitarist or on Twitter as at Pract Guitarist. Support the show. Merchandise is available in our Threadless store at practicalguitaristpodcast.threadless.com. And donate to us via Patreon, available at patreon.com slash practicalguitarist. Reach out to us directly via email at questions at practicalguitarist.com. Hi, Jim. Hi, David. <laughs> um, it's been one of those days, and uh, <laughs> I think we have a lot to discuss tonight. We uh, do. Oh, crap. I got oh. All right, all right, all right. I got, I got an issued apology to a show listener. Uh, <laughs> before I do, before I do anything, I have to issue an apology to a show listener. Um, Jeff Biesiadecki, and I, I, he's a good time, and and he and I have had a lot of conversations about Helix going back and forth. And uh, I've been, you know, vehemently defending the Helix, and like there is some there is some justification to that, but but and I'll get into that. But I I want to say that I, you are correct. The two amps definitely are superior to even today's modeling devices in a couple of ways. And that mostly it has to do with being in the room sound. And then also just, just the, the straight up feel of it. Like I can feel that there is no latency between when, when I play a note and when it comes out of the helix. And I think it, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I play the helix all the time. And then I plugged into my Mark five this morning, which uh-huh. is sitting right there behind me. Um, and it was just, it was way, it was a way different response. And like, I found myself playing a little bit better through the Mark five. I can compensate and play with both without really any issue whatsoever. But I think for, you know, like future purposes, I think that's probably more where I'm headed is to like, try and get that kind of feel out of gear. And if that means that digital gear will not give me that with amp modeling, at least, then I will probably stick to, or analog stuff. So how um, much how much difference did you feel? I mean, was that a was it a It was a totally that? so so for the audience sake, they're not going to have any idea. Like they're not going to know at all. But I know and I can feel like it, it's it's a thing about attack and responsiveness. And that and that's basically all it is. Like for me, I mean, yes, obviously like the game characteristics and stuff are different. Um I find that this puts out a lot more high-end content than what I get out of the Mark IV model in the Helix. Um, again, these are not the same amp, which is, which could be part of that. Um, but I feel I feel this is way more direct to my ears. Like, I hit the note, I don't feel like there's any anything impeding that. And it just comes right out of the amp. And um, I think it really comes down to, like I said, I still think I can feel latency to some extent. And I don't think it's in my head. I really don't. Um, I think, I think there's something to it because it just, it, it changed the characteristics of the sound to me. Um, and the, and the way that I, uh, was, um, attacking the strings and those kinds of things very significantly more so than like flipping from amp model to amp model. Um, I think the effects that are in, that are in Helix and we'll get to that. I'm sure this episode are yes, we will. still outstanding. I mean, I, I still think, um, I just haven't done enough AB testing with the Helix out front to find out what kind of latency is involved uh, or if even that's necessary. Um, the amps I tend to use tend to be pretty damn versatile. And I rarely, if anything, I'm using a drive pedal 
um, it would usually just be a fuzz pedal out front of some sort. So um, I can feel the pull towards going back to a more, or at least having like an analog rig available to me. And, and I feel that it's going to happen eventually. It's not something that I'm like, you know, head over heels going to do it right now. Um, I still think right now the helix for doing like open mics and stuff is probably a better alternative. Um, so I'm not, I'm not ditching it. I don't think it's bad. I think it's a great tool to have in the arsenal. Um, I just think that I underestimated what I'm expecting from a piece of equipment. <laughs> and so, and, and that, that adjusted my expectations for, for those, for listeners who don't know, I have a Mesa Mark 525 and a matching one by 12 um, rectal cab with a V30 in it. And um, I rarely get to play this thing in my condo at any reasonable volume. So I barely touch it because, I mean, I'm afraid that I'm going to piss off the neighbors. And you, you know, you don't piss on your neighbors because it's just going to make life a living hell. That's right. So, yep. especially um, in condo life. Right. I, we should do an episode about that, like playing guitar in a condo and all the challenges that presents. Because there's more can, than just that. I think we can touch on that. I mean, yeah. so obviously there's the amp one, but you can kind of see it, right? Yeah, there. yeah. Um, so I've been using the amp one more lately. Um, I still have the katana. It's actually off screen here. Um, the uh, the thing that um, so here's the elephant in the room, and the reason that uh, Dave said we will be talking about the helix, um, uh, the effects that, in the helix, yeah. I, I decided to um, ditch the HD 500 going with the HF uh, HF effects for two yeah, The HX effects. Yeah, I know HX. Why couldn't they just call it the Helix effects? I know. It, like it, what the fuck? That's really I mean, what the HX stands for. Yes, I mean, everybody so what knows they, that. So what they did was, for those who don't know, they took the hel- the effects units, uh, the effects out of the um, Helix, including the IRs, but not the amp model. And stuck them into a smaller box with or the cabinet or the cabinet models, but yeah, right, no cabinet models, right. So all you have is you do have an IR, and you can load IRs into it. You have, I, what do I have? Half as many buttons. I have uh, uh, six. You have eight. Yeah, you have. Yeah, you have six. I have twelve. I think you have twelve. I yeah. think it's twelve. Yeah, you. I think you have twice as many as I. Yeah. And um, uh, well, I have eight if you include the mode and the te- tuner mode. So um, I think what you have is effectively you have a lot more buttons than me, probably about um, twice as many. Yeah, I have twelve, and then and then the, and then the uh, foot switch for the and then the foot switch. Wow. Yeah, I have six in the foot switch. But then again, I can have well, no, yeah, two. Four. So I can have up to nine effects in a chain. Right. Um, Maybe some deal here. Chains. Yep. And uh, I can have um, so I can have stereo, and the buttons. Uh, will only allow me to turn on and off um, single effects, or I can put like, let's say I know that I'm always going to turn this and this on at the same time with this button. Yeah. Put those in there. Um, you know about how the buttons work and, and uh, we can go into that, but um, I really like it. I mean, when, you, when, when I told you I was getting rid of the HD 500, it, it, you, you know, you gave me a lot of in, a really good information. And I went and I tried well, it. Uh, to, to give our viewers some context, I basically told Jim, I don't think he's going to be happy with any of these devices. Right. And it wasn't like, I wasn't saying that in a derogatory way. I was just saying like, look, if the HD 500 didn't do it for you, maybe it's because you're just not, you know, like you don't really want this stuff. Like, right. and that, and that's a big part of it. So, right. So, and to let the listeners know what I was looking to get was pretty simple stuff that you can get every people talk about all oh, the, it does this pedal well. It does that pedal well. It emulates this amp. It emulates that amp. It emulates. But the one thing I couldn't do was when I hit a button, get a screaming solo. And that's as easy as putting it. it um, I use a, uh, what is it? TSA Electronics Park Boost. Yeah, J- Jim's, a, Jim's a hardcore devotee to having an effects loop boost. Yeah. Like that's, it, what, that's what he wants. And if you can't get that, then it's not going to work. And actually, you were absolutely right because I started reading about the HD500 after you mentioned it. There is no single volume boost in that amp or in that that uh, modeler, which is absolutely appalling. Right. It's it's just I, I could not believe it. And so I I bought this, and the only reason I brought it home was because I got another four. You know, I rebo- rebooted my forty five days of trial, right. and 
And the bigger thing was if it didn't, if it didn't get a boost to me, I was like, all right, I'm out of line six. I'm out yeah. of line. I, I'm done. Yeah. I'll just go to conventional pedals and be done with it. So, um, but I wanted for the money, when you think about what you get, you get um you get the all the M stuff. So you get your yeah. you get your, get your you plus know, the helix stuff. Right, all the helix stuff, yeah. all the M series stuff, all the DL fours, all the lines. Jim, Jim can, I, can I ask you a question though? How yeah. much of the M series stuff are you actually using? Yeah, I know. Probably one or two things. Well, that's no, probably none of them. I'm gonna be honest with you. Like the stuff that Helix has in it sounds better. It just sounds better. Like all of it does. And because I have access to the same um the same suite of you know models that you do. Yep. Um and really? I, I I have to say, yeah, because we we got we got the same update that when the Helix FX uh, HXFX came out. We got yep. all the same models and um there were a couple that I was like, oh, I'm really excited to see this one brought back. And then I would dial it up and I'd be like, what the hell? Like, this isn't how I remember it at all. Like, all right, <laughs> back to the other one, you know. Um, but I, I, this is the question that I ask everybody who's who's used it. You know, what do you think of the drive pedals? Because that's what everybody says. Like, oh, the you know, if it's a good modeler, the drive pedals are okay. If it's a bad modeler, the drive pedals are shit. <laughs> And so I haven't had a chance to really dive. The, the problem with these things, and I think everybody gets it, is you have an overload. All of a sudden you have, you have what is equivalent to um, 100 and plus pedals at your, at your disposal. Yeah. And you're like, uh, do I put this pedal? Because what I did was I stacked, first thing I did was just play around and I stacked a bunch of buzz pedals. That sounded like dog shit. Yeah. So, so then I had to pull all the buzz pedals off. But the beauty is you just, you just click a little X button. Yeah, and they're, off they're, and they're gone, right? They're gone. And then you just, you know, click around till you find the one you want. So, and I, yeah, it, go ahead. It's interesting that you're, you're describing it this way, that you, that you, um, you have an overload, a sensory overload. Because I think, I think there's like three distinct phases of when you get a modeling device. And the first phase is like new cars, shiny, hundreds and thousands of different things it can do. And you're like, oh, this is awesome. And then you go through this phase where like, you program it, you play around with some of the different effects and you find out there's like five you're going to use like yep. total of the whole yep. thing. Then yep. you have buyer's remorse because it's like, well, I could have just bought the five real effects. Yep. And then, and then you have like this moment of, yeah, but if I ever need that other one, you know, at least I have it. Right. And at the end of the day, like I've always, I think there's a fourth stage for a lot of people that, that not everybody gets into, but the fourth stage is like, yeah, you know, it's really good and, it, and it's a flexible Swiss army knife, yep. but you know, and then that's that, that, but is the, is basically the fourth stage is like, I don't really need that. And right. for a lot of people, they don't. You're, you're absolutely right. And so um, to put things in perspective, or at least into a uh, um, context for me is that it gives me the ability to, when I get to that cover gig, I can go from having an Ottawa with a um, so I have I have um, one setting where I have to have an Ottawa, a tremolo, and a um, uh, what do you call it a, a harmonizer to play one song, yeah. just just the intro riff to one song, and then I have to get out of that to play the rest of the song, and then go back to it to play that intro again because it comes back, and then go out of it and play a solo. So so yes. Um, and then, um, so that goes into the fact that, and I didn't know this about Helix. This is something that you knew, not, not that I expected you to tell Jim, this is something you should know. I, I, yeah. No. And it's, I know what you're going to talk about and it's hard to describe, isn't it? Yeah. There's a delay. <laughs> yeah. When you go between banks and, and effects, if you pull up a new effect set, you have a delay. Yeah. So they, they built the snapshot feature to fix that. I'm not going to go into what, and I don't think we should try to explain it on the show. No. If you get one of these things, just know that you should be using snapshots to do a lot of that stuff because yes. snapshots will assist you with, you know, navigating through things without the delay in between, especially during song. Cool. Um, the other thing, uh, you, so we're talking about the drive pedals and, and just basically like having these stages and, and getting to this idea that um, it's not necessarily everything everybody needs. You can do all of those things that you're suggesting with a switching system, but the drawback to that is you have to be the programming language between each of these devices. So like you have to know how to speak MIDI and you don't have to, 
you have to know how to program your unit to put out the right control signals for anything that's tap tempo. And, um, yep. and you have to buy this complicated switching zone. And that's what I was going to get at. So I had an ES8. I had the boss ES8. And that thing is fantastic. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, if, if I were to go back to analog pedals and, and have, like, a complicated rig again, I would yep. probably get one and, and use the MIDI programming functionality and just be happy with the four sounds that I need. Um, the, the, uh, I think the flexibility that the ES8 gives you is actually greater than what you get in Helix. And I mentioned a couple of the features I had set up on my, uh, my ES8, like the pro when I would change patches, the, the button I used to actually change from patch to patch would then become the tap tempo. So I could hit the patch button and then just keep tapping it and yep. like not even have to think about the fact that, you know, that the, the patch delay may have been you know, 300 milliseconds or whatever. Right. Um, and that was super useful, not something I can configure on the helix, at least not yet. And I think there are, um, I think there are some other drawbacks. I, but ultimately it comes down to how complicated do you want to get? And if you're going to if you're going to do something uber complicated with cars with a lot of programming and you have to have a lot of patches, I think the HX effects or a Helix or the Helix LT or even the stomp are probably the, the go-to boxes. Yeah. Um, right now for, for, you know, people who are budget conscious, like yeah. that's the way to do it. You can also, you know, look at Axe effects and, and, and Kemper for some of these things as well. But I find that, um, you know, why spend, why spend $3,000 on, on the current Axe effects when you could just buy a Helix for like 1500 and be happy. Yeah. Well, there's there's that, and the fact that literally you can take a helix, and there's nothing else on your pedal board. Yep, yep. And, and if you wanted, you know this, you could use your Mark V as your front end. Yeah, and I do that, the four cable method. Um, That's right. And and but it doesn't give me the response because there is no analog pass through. And if and if the helix had analog pass through, I think that would be far more useful to me. So like if I didn't have any effects engaged at all, uh, and that's why I think I'm going to, I haven't tested this yet. Like I've used it in four cable and stuff, but I haven't tested this particular part yet. Like, am I going to feel that delay? Um, as I was describing earlier in the episode, right? if I run four cable, because it will not be analog bypass. Like if it were, if it were like plugging a cable directly into the amp when the helix is not in use, that's one thing. Right. Um, but I don't think it's going to be that. And so I think, my perceptions of it will still be, it's a great tool. I'm not going to throw it under the bus. I think, I think I'm still going to continue to use mine for a really long time, uh, at least until, you know, the next iteration or whatever comes out. Um, it makes a great backup tool and, and that kind of thing. But ultimately I think I want that immediate feel, you know, the, the bad thing is I sat in front of um, my TV watching. Um, actually I was listening to the interview with, um, uh, Thomas Blug that was on No Guitar is Safe. And by the way, we had him here first. Um, yes, we did. He was, he was on No Guitar Safe. The interview is excellent. If you haven't heard it, go, go pay them, you know, pay the visit, you know, and, and can listen. And there's this part in there where he talks about part of the reason why he's not into the digital stuff is because he's like, I feel this delay. You know, I feel this, this lack of sensitivity. And, and that's why I would describe it as it's like a lack of sensitivity. Um, and I, I laugh because I'm like, when I heard him say it in the episode, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like, because I hadn't been playing my Mark V. And so I got it out the other day. Like, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, I'm going to have to use my words now. Yeah, I did admit that he was right. Yeah, he is. <laughs> you know, God damn it. <laughs> so you say that because I, that's exactly what. So when, when David and I were talking about me bringing the um, HD 500, I said, I just don't feel the response. But and I, I do, did. and I, you saw what I said, though, right? Yeah, but I'll be honest with you. When I said that to you, I hadn't had yet played the Mark V again, like, right. and had it in a reasonable volume. I said that to you, and in the back of my mind, going, he's full of shit if he says response. <laughs> and, and so what I've done, so the, what you don't see on the floor right now, so <clears throat> is I've got my, my old pedals are in between the um helix uh set so way, the way my chain is going is into the helix out of the helix pretty much it just goes in and out yeah then the helix dirt pedals if i so choose to use them or not and then my dirt pedals into the front of the amp from the effects uh the first effect send 
of the of the HF HF effects. Yeah, the helix. Let's just call it a helix. Let's just call yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's his modeling device. The middle, the middle, he, the mini helix. Then out of the amp send back into the return on this thing, and then the output of this back into the return of the amp. And honestly, I got it back. So there is a there is a response that I'm getting. So long as I don't have anything in the way, if I use my pedals and I go in, but I don't process anything, I go right back out. I think it has to do with what's what's taking longer for the helix to process. Yep. Um, And I think amp modeling probably takes a lot more processing power than a a distortion model, which I I could be completely wrong on that. I have no idea. But the other thing is, I I think the, um, the HXFX does have the um the true bypass or whatever the yeah so if you well, not true anything, bypass but buffered not, you know buffered. what I mean it's a, it's a buffered bypass but it's not it's not converted to digital if you're right. not running through any of the effects exactly. I, if I recall that's one of the selling points of that um I could definitely see myself um you know getting rid of the the helix and going to a helix stomp yeah and and the only reason is because really all I would use it for it's like amp modeling. But then at that point, like I might as well just buy uh, an amp one. Right. Right. Cause then it's all and, analog. Uh, like I have nothing to worry about. Right. Um, if you really wanted the, the IR, the nice thing is for people who are, who are wondering, um, uh, cause I asked Dave, cause I'm not an IR guy. I'm going to yeah. be the first person to admit that I know nothing. I, I, can I share my, I, can I share my, my insight to you the other day? Jim was yeah. asking me some questions about IRs and I said, if you want to know if something is true or what you can do with it, just instead of the word IR or impulse response, just say cabinet model. <laughs> Cause then it totally makes sense. <laughs> right. And so since I'm using my front end of one of my amps and going into back into this thing, I already have emulated the amp and I say, emulated yeah. using it. Yeah. So you don't need an amp model. So I don't need an amp model. So really the only thing is to, and I want to get a couple of IRs to try it out, is to go IR post on the out on the other output. Yeah. And so that way I can send one directly to the board and the other one just comes out here to back to the amp and the amp is is, you know, sending it over to this cabinet. Well, so I, yes, are the cabinets going to sound different? But very um, different. that's just for me to model. model. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's the other thing is like People think that what you have on stage has to match what's coming through the modeler to the, you know, to the outboard or whatever. And that's right. completely false. Yeah. And in fact, more often than not, what you might want on stage for your, for your monitor signal, your side fill, may be totally different than what you want coming out of front of house. Yeah. Um, and, and commensurate with that, the, uh, the amp one has a really good out on it, a uh, cabinet yeah. emulated out. So. Yeah. Yeah, and there's that side. Plus, as I as I talk to David, I may pick up the blue box. Yeah, I don't um, know. I mean, I honestly like the blue box. If you're gonna go all amp one stuff, like you're gonna have the amp one, and then you're gonna have the switching system. It's gonna and, be a switching system. Yeah, and you're not gonna have anything else. Like then you get the switching system, and you get the blue box, and you're you're all set. Right. I don't know that the blue box is really like the be all end all. But if the blue box had like three slots for IRs, I would be all over that thing. But, well, it's, uh, but I they're think, all built in, right? I think it's 30, yeah, they're all they're all preloaded. Right. And um I do like the fact that you can adjust the microphone position and stuff in them. So it's probably like some sort of crossfade between IRs, which is cool. That's something that conventional IR technology doesn't give you unless you set up some sort of fancy mixing situation and you're panning back and forth or whatever. Um which which is fine. Um but I just without having to being able to use it before I get it, like that would be, that would be the deal breaker for me. I have to be able to put it into my doll and find out exactly what I can do with it. The other thing that the Helix does that's super cool is yeah, I think yours has, yours has the USB, right? So you can, you can record through it as an interface. Yep. The, the, the guitar sounds out of the, out of the Helix direct into your, your digital audio workstation are freaking great. Um, I was tracking with it the other day. And I started to listen to some of the some of the um, just the clean guitar tracks that I was taking out of the like the reamp, and they sounded really good. And I was like, okay, so maybe I won't have to buy a fancy interface to replace my UR22, which right. doesn't do a great job with guitar. 
is great with with microphones. I mean, but it just does not do a great job with guitar unless you have some sort of stepping thing going on. And then yeah, and that's the other downside off. of um, the HX effects. It does not have microphone interface. Well, there's no, but the, and the, and the other thing about the HX effects that I don't like is that there's no metering. But that's the same thing of all the Helix products. I mean, really, Line Six would it have killed you to put a VU meter on the side of it so that you would know how hot your guitar is coming in and out? Yep, it would have been nice. Yeah. The other, the other, um, yeah. There's some downsides. I, I honestly, I had to, it took a little get, getting used to as far as the tuner goes because the way the tuner lines up. It's I hate a, that effing tuner. You knew what I was complaining about. Yeah, so I'm leaving my old tuner. Yeah, and your two, TU3 is right next to it on your board. Well, like your board is like a TU3 and then like I, the HXFX. Yeah. So, yeah, as far as the line goes. So what I've got is, is as far as physically, it's the HS, HXFX next to, um, to the right and the amp one to the left. And then above those is all my old dirt pedals. Yeah, and that's just because honestly, I hate to say you know what I don't need my Wampler drive, but if this thing winds up where I can find something that I can use to replace, you know, to the, approximate uh, it, yeah, yeah, the underdog circuit of the over, um, the uh, what do you call it? And of course the fuzz, I, I and then I mean the board will still. I mean I'm not going to get rid of my board, but yeah, it's just, not as not as necessary. No, it, it'll just be these two, and then when I get it, the controller for the amp one and then the blue box if i do that yeah so i'm leaning more and more towards i know i need i'm i'm not getting one this year um but i'm i am going to get another amp um i'm leaning towards I, I there's a couple of things that are on my short list that i'm looking at if i see a good deal i might i might part with cash that i don't have um <laughs> to get one i might have it at the time i don't have it right now um <coughs> but the main thing is uh, I need another amp I, I before I can do anything. And then like the Helix will probably, I, I'll evaluate my situation with Helix when I go to the stop or, um, or well, next year. That. Yeah. Next year I'm going to sit down with a Lone Star and a Mark five. I'm going to side by side. I'm going to make a decision. I think you can get a Lone Star. Don't oh. worry about the Mark five. That's not oh. for you. That's for. It's it, it, and for kind of sewers. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's for, for the wine, the wine. Yeah. Taste. The cork sniffers. Oh wait, what's that amp over there? Oh, Mark Five. Oh, yeah. Don't sorry, me, Jim. Sorry, I don't Jim. want you to have. I don't, to I don't want you to think I'm sniffing corks here. Um, <laughs> is he got the fancy grill and everything? Yeah, I've got the wicker. The wicker grill. It's beautiful. Yeah. Look at that, man. It's yeah, it does look gorgeous. I, I, I'll be completely honest. It's classic. Like I, so they've got. Um, Good Time has a couple of different ones. They have. Um, of course, they usually have black, but they're usually in the box. They don't even usually have those out because they have. Uh, they have some nice floor models. They have one in freaking seafoam green with the brown uh, leather corners. Oh, that was really good looking. And then they have uh they have like the the light gray one. Yeah. It's kind of it's kind of like uh it looks like a carpet almost, not a carpet, but um like a, a fl- like a flannel kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like I was looking at that, I was like, "Oh god, I want that." Like, so I have to I have to be careful when I go in there because the likelihood of me coming home with something that is just beautiful, but I already yeah. own is <laughs> extremely high. Oh yeah. <coughs> well, you, know, you know, that, um, uh, as you said, likely I'll wind up and, and, and I'm almost a hundred percent sure about it that I'll get a loan, another loan or the California mm-hmm. or the film war. There's all these different ones they're doing now. I and loved, uh, you know what I loved? There were three things I loved about the Lone Star. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you the last one will be the most important. I'll tell you the first one. I loved the two channels. I loved the variety I could get from the two channels. It was two very independent because they had their own EQs and everything else. Yeah. Um, I love so more. Yep. I loved the fact that I could go from 30 to 15 to five watts. Yeah. And, you're not going to get that in the film more, but yep. you're going to get the same volume levels. Yep. And lastly, if not least, I loved the tone of that amp. And, yeah. you know, it, that amp is really been my um it was my go-to for these 10 years so i think <laughs> of the two amps i suggested i don't think the film wars would be the one you would gravitate towards out of those two i think it would be the california and the only reason is because the california is kind of like i see that as like 
because so when Mesa designed the the Lone Star, and I'm probably going to sound like a complete asshole here, but and 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 like an idiot because I I may be wrong on some of this, but it just seems to me that they designed an amp that's kind of tweetish. Like it's like a, it's like, it's not blackface. Like that, that amp is not a blackface fender. It is more tweed like tweed. and the California is their take on a tweed amp. It is a boogie tweed. Um, so it's like, what if they took a Mark one and then made it like more tweed esque and then clone the channels kind of like the Phil. I think they cloned the channels with it. I like the Fillmore. So you get two of the same channel, then you could just set them up completely independently. And I think you get, I think you get multiple game stages and all that. The, the, the Fillmore is cool that way. Cause it's the same thing. It's a Mark one. That's more like geared towards a blackface fender. Right. So. So, yeah. And so anyway, like I said, I, I really love the tone of that amp. I love the feel of it. I love the response of it. I love everything about that amp. It, <clears throat> people who haven't um, played a, a Mesa um, in those, ran- now I'm not talking about, the triple Rex and the dual Rex. I'm talking. I'm about, looking at the triple crown. Yeah, it's. I'm, I got my eyes on it, and I hope. I hope they come out with a dual crown, 25 watt. That would be nice, right? Yeah, if they came out with a dual crown, I'd be all over that thing. Mesa, if you're listening, which I know you're not, because we only have tens of listeners. <laughs> triple crown, do it. Dual crown, do it. I want it. 25 watts, EL84 power. I'm all over that thing. You'll have my order on day like three or something. Yeah. Whenever I get the cash. Yep. <clears throat> so yeah, that's a very real by next summer. Um, I'll be doing that. So anyway, um, moving right along. Uh, so the HF effects for me right now, it's got the big thumbs up. It, it gave me that clean boost. I wanted it gave me the um, it so far. It's given me the effects I wanted. It's given me the versatility I wanted. It's done everything I wanted it to do. Any negatives? Uh, yep. Okay. Um, you and I talked about it. Snap. Um, getting between banks. I I am not used to having a big delay between presets. Right. Yeah, big presets. And it's so it's a big delay. It's a half snap. second or something, but yep, it's I enough that you have to time between songs. Yep. Well, no, between songs, I'm fine. Yeah, okay, so then so then you shouldn't need presets to like during a song. No, just snapshot. Yeah, that's that's Correct. what you're supposed to do. And then, of course, the snapshot navigation kind of sucks. Yeah, so I have to make sure I hit the two buttons. What, what I'll do is, between songs, once I get to my preset, I'll hit those buttons, have them right. ready, so that when I'm during the song, I can just hit snapshot A, B, and C, which is what I was doing before we started. I was writing my songs down and writing what snapshots I'd be using yeah. presets. So the cool thing, you probably haven't, I maybe you have explored this already, but you can label all the... Um, because you got scribble strips on yours. That's right. Yep. And then you could also do the colors. Yep. So you know what what's driving, you know, all that stuff, which is cool. Yep. And I can I can scribble strip in um the when I go to the bank, I can say, Oh, there's that song. I can hit that song. And can can to, I ask you a question? This is a dumb question. They've got a they've got a preset change coming as far as I know. Or I mean yeah. a snapshot change coming. Yeah, that's the snapshot update is going to allow you to exclude certain effects from the snapshot so that you can turn them on. And then if you switch snapshots, it'll stay on or stay off yep. depending on how you want it, which yep. would be kind of nice. It's basically snapshot exclusion, which is something that I actually was yelling at line six for when, uh, when I first started using snapshots. Um, anyway, uh, I, I had one question I wanted to ask you before we move on to whatever the next topic is. And that is, um, how much during a set are you actually using drive pedals? I mean, with the amp one, it's got more than enough gain. Oh yeah. No. Okay. So <clears throat> for me, a drive pedal isn't about gain. And this is, this is going to sound weird to everybody, but it's more about, okay, so I'm going to do an eighties thing, or I'm going to do a, uh, take, a, take two. I'll give you two examples. Let's say I'm going from far behind. Okay, which has a very clean, extremely clean, um, uh, highly delayed intro, right? right? Goes into this really raunchy, hard driving. Um, yeah, so you're you're using it as a filter, I'm guessing. Yeah, more like a okay. filter, like an yeah. EQ filter. You got it. Right, right. Okay, all right. No, I I got you because I use uh, I've been using that tube screamer I have through the yeah. um, Mark V over there uh, to tighten up the bass, and it's doing a pretty good job. Yep. Um, 
Because when you hit, as you know, and I know, when you hit that um, overdrive thing, you want that delay to go away until you're hitting a solo um, single note thing, but you still need that crunchiness, but you don't want it to be flabby, you know, on the outside. Like, like Right, right. So you're tightening up the bass. And um, I, I, my whole thing, like when you start stacking drive pedals into dirty amps is, you know, you get all these crazy frequencies above 5K that like sound like razor blades. And it's really, really hard for me to take that on my ears when I'm playing. So yep. a lot of times, like, I think for a boost pedal, a lot of times I'm better off just using a, using an EQ. That's so that uh, I was about to say that. So um, one of the things is that I've learned that I can use one of the EQ pedals. Let's say I use the uh, LA studio. I think you called it. Oh, that's the, a comp. Not the LA comp. Um, what's the, the parametric? Yeah. The and regular I, parametric or the, or the 10 band or. Yep. And then that way, when I'm boosting, cause everybody, um, when you think about, when you think about going into a uh, a boosted situation, what happens is you boost those, what you were talking about, those frequencies. Yeah, so the stuff that's on the floor that you don't normally hear also right. gets boosted. And so what happens is a lot of those overtones and things get boosted, and now all of a sudden they're right out there, and it's like, ah. So you can tweak them off. So it's nice to use an EQ, um, a parametric EQ or a 10-band EQ, kind of smooth that out when you go into the solo so it's not, it's not killing your, you know, your ears. And if it's killing your ears, it's killing their ears. Right. Right. Even worse. So let's switch topics. Yep. Okay. Cut you off right in the middle of this. Um, <laughs> we are talking tonight about maintenance, right? Is that, That's right. that accurate? So uh, it's that time of year I wrote down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, nobody can see me, but. It's always that time of year for me, man. Like my shit always needs to go into the shop. <clears throat> so it's that time of year, folks. It's coming to March and March means that. Not only is it March Madness, we're going to start seeing the humidity shift, your temperatures shift, the heater isn't going to be on as much. Going to get um, so it's time to look at what's going to happen because again, our guitars are made of wood, most of us, <laughs> and <laughs> oh, I said wood, <laughs> and uh, as for the eight-year-olds, and then so uh, you know, and the more guitars you have. The more you should really be worried about, especially with acoustics, um, uh, as well as electrics, what maintenance you're going to do on your guitars. Um, so, uh, Dave, you you have um, uh, the Fender esque guitars. I have one. Okay. I'm a, I want to start off. I, I, I want to dispel a myth. Yep. Electric guitars don't need maintenance. I've heard people say this before that they require less maintenance than an acoustic. Bullshit. Bull- yeah. I call it bullshit. They need just as much maintenance, if not more in some cases, depending on what the guitar is. Um, I think so acoustic guitars, yes, they have mahogany necks, like, but they're usually finished. Um, even if it's a satin finish. Uh some electric guitars with maple necks, if they're unfinished, they can be all over the place. The first thing you're gonna want to want to keep track of really is humidity in your environment. I held up my uh hygrometer here. And it says it's 45% here. It's really, really cold wow. out today. And the air is blowing hard. So this is not surprising to me. Um, I'm not boiling a pot of water. If it gets below if it gets below 40, I, I will put a pot of water on the stove and start boiling water and stuff. I've had it. Uh, this winter was brutal. It got down to 29% in here. Wow. And my, my, all my guitars had fret sprout. Like it was really bad. Um, it's starting to settle in. My my frets are are getting back in alignment and stuff now. So I'm I'm pleased that nothing cracked, which is nice. Um, but the main thing is like when when the, when the humidity drops like that, the first thing I notice is fret sprout. Number one, that's because it's obvious when you pick up the guitar. Um, yeah. The other thing you'll notice is that the action seems a little off. Usually the action will seem a little bit better, but the guitar yeah. buzz like hell. Yep, like a and, buzz like a. <laughs> yeah and you're like why is this if you if you're if you're newer at guitar you'll be like why is this well you need a truss rod adjustment and so um a couple of weeks ago i just got up in the morning and i got my feeler gauge out and i i adjusted all of my necks to you know 10 you know ten thousands or whatever ten one hundreds or whatever it is yeah. um and they're all great now like i in fact i took uh the the blue s500 out yesterday and i haven't played it in a while it was in a case took it out Sided the neck, saw that it had no relief, 
put the relief in it, and then it was very rock and roll. I used it. I used it yesterday, and was really pleased with the way it played. So I'm actually. I want to say I want to toot my horn for a second. I'm really pleased with myself because for years I was like, I'm not touching that truss rod, and and it's not because I'm a. I was afraid of it. It's right. because, um, I was never quite sure how much adjustment to put into a guitar to get it where I wanted, and like. I was always afraid that I would strip the truss rod because I, I have stripped the truss rod before that that's happened. Um, I stripped the Squire P base truss rod. Well, okay. <laughs> um, which again, I, I was it willing was to work fire. on that guitar because I knew it was shit anyway. Yep. So, um, but anyway, I, I, I've now gotten to the point, and this is what I'm proud of, where I can do complete setups on my guitars without really batting an eye and thinking about it. And they, they play pretty good. They're not, so they're not fantastic. About- Let's talk about some of the tools that one needs to um, adjust and do your maintenance when, on your guitar. So one of the things you got to talk about there, and there's all many, so many schools of thoughts about this one. It's fretboard maintenance. Oh, I don't Fretboard maintenance is one thing. I think that's, that's annual or biannual, depending on how much yep. you play them. Um, I use the well, Dunlop stuff. Just go get your Dunlop care kit. Re- yep. Use what they recommend. And that will probably last you the lifetime of your guitar. Yeah, probably. It'll I, probably I mean, last you the lifetime of all your guitars, frankly. Because unless, yeah, because unless you have like, and you're doing maintenance on hundred guitars or whatever, you're just not going to burn through that because you literally use droplets at a time. So what I do do when I take my strings off and I put new strings on, just because I don't like that finger gunk that gets on the fretboard. Yeah. And people, I know people tell you not to. People tell you all you got to do is use a damp cloth. It doesn't have to be damp with oil just use a a, it doesn't need to be soaking wet but a a damp cloth and just wipe that gunk off yeah it it helps um if you get build up credit card yep cut a credit 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 card to fit between your frets and use it to scrape the shit off and then use um the dunlop i think it's dunlop dunlop cleaner yeah i don't know they have a regular cleaner they have a um, lubricant oil now if you have a fretboard conditioner is Fretboard conditioner, you go. Because it'll you have, cause it to pop out. Right. If you have a finished fretboard, maple fretboard, don't use that stuff. Yeah, just wipe it down with just a damn cloth. Yeah. In fact, um, I find that they look better when they're nasty. So yeah, and that's I the thing about them. Never wipe my they, maples off. They actually look better nasty. You can know one thing. You'll know where you play most of your notes. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, I got, I, got, I got some shit from... Uh, Jimmy, the guy that sets up a lot of my guitars from Good Time, he um, the last time I took one in and I had to have front work because I I do take them in twice a year for for you know crown and polish level and all that. And um, he goes he goes, man, you sure do play a lot on the the high E, the B, and the G string. Yeah, <laughs> that was like yeah. Well, there's yeah, there's I'm, definitely I'm guilty. <laughs> there's definitely proof in where your fingerprints are, but there's also I'll tell you what. Next time I take it, he's gonna be like, holy shit, how much work are you doing at the at the first fret? <laughs> like yeah, front where. Yeah, your fretware obviously gives it away too. Um, but anyway, uh, some of the other things you can do because it's it. They make a, a specific tool that's designed to polish a fret that you can get um, if you're if you're so inclined. Um, some people, uh, it, what are you, you do? About, have, are you talking about the guard thing that you put yeah. around the fret? Yeah. yeah so guard, quad steel wool, and uh, masking tape. And Don't mask- buy the guard. You just move the masking tape as you go. And, you know, to be honest with you, um, I've actually had even better luck with Jeweler's Rouge and a Dremel. Yeah. That makes that shit so smooth that, you, like, it's like stainless steel. But to be totally, completely honest, I don't think guitars rarely need a fret polish. No. People, uh, people tend to think, like, oh, well, if I want to get a crown, like, then I need to polish it. Yes, that's probably true because you've roughed up the fret. But but with just regular old strings, you're not roughing the fret up enough to, to actually need a, a pop. Yeah, I'm just going. Yeah, I'm just going over some of the tools. So one of those is nice to have. It's it's just it looks like a little um, thing with a slit in the middle that goes over the fret, um, and they cost a few bucks. They're not that expensive, but like Dave said, you can use um, plain old. Now on the cheap, and that's that's just it. On the cheap, you can just use masking tape, and and to be honest with you, it'll work just as well. Yeah. Um, the objective is so you're not as you're using that li- really really light wool on the fret. Um, you're not you're not. Uh, yeah. Make sure you cover your pickups too with tape. 
Yeah, and definitely cover the pickups because they that's metal filings, and guess what's got magnet in it? Yeah, so cover your pickups with tape. When you get all the magnets on, or the magnetic filings on there, another pro tip: put tape over the top of it when you lift them off, and then it'll stay. But yep, so yep. Um, so one of the other things um, David mentioned these that you should have is feeler gauge. If you yeah now now. There are standards. When I say standards, it's, um, you know, if you buy your guitar, the company says. Yeah, it's the manufacturer setup. Be, right. This, that the E string, the low E string, the bottom of the low E string should be this high up first fret, this high up 12th fret or whatever fret. And then the, yeah. um, is it the 12th fret or the 15th fret? I can't remember. Anyway. And then. Depends uh, on the manufacturer. Yeah. And then the um, uh, high E string should be this high and this high. And that's how you set up your bridge and that's how you set up it. Now, of course, that is, that depends on your feel. You may like higher action. You might like lower action. It also depends on what you can get away with on the guitar too. Not every guitar reacts to the same setup the same way. And it has to do with, number one, how level was the fretboard when they put it together? Uh, how how level are the frets? How... Um, how accurate was the fret level? How much relief is in the neck? I mean, all of these factors play in. Yeah, and how level are they now? And so on. The, and the other thing that um, that you want to talk about that, and that goes right along with it, is obviously you need um, the tools to be able to move uh, the action up and down, and you should have a truss rod wrench. Um, yeah, well, a truss rod wrench, even a, just a standard Allen Allen wrench, kit will do it yeah. for most guitars. I think Gibson uses what these uh, uh, Phillips, right? Yep. Okay, so just just have the right wrench for what you're doing. If the guitar is an import guitar, chances are it's going to be metric. If it's a, if it's an American made instrument, chances are it's going to be uh, like aerial. So just yep. make sure that you have the right Allen wrenches because some the Allen keys that they use a lot of times will be super similar, and you can strip a truss rod just by using the metric in a yeah. In so. A, in a, in a, <clears throat> So my Gibson has a, uh, as Dave was saying, it looks like a um, a 90 degree turned um, uh, Phillips head, but my PRSs use um, the, what would be the female side of an Allen key. Right. Instead of the male side. So you're used to going out by an Allen wrench and the Allen wrench goes in there and they have a, um, it looks like a little pipe. Yeah. <laughs> And you That's what that I was on. thinking of. I couldn't remember. I bear. I don't think I've ever touched my Gibson's truss rod. Yeah, it's usually. I've, that's when I get adjusted for me twice a year, and I don't play it enough to um, to need it all the time. So, I yeah, I adjusted it um, because I put lighter strings on it, um, and I've adjusted the PRSs myself. Um, yeah. So, and if you've got a um, obviously you should have Phillips head screwdriver, fly head screwdriver. If you've got a Floyd Rose, hopefully you know that uh, how to adjust your tension on your Floyd Rose. Try to use the right size screwdrivers too, because that's another thing. And I'm not talking about the Phillips set so much like on a, on a tunematic style bridge, you'll have the two big posts where the, uh, the stop tail is. Mm -hmm. And if you use the wrong size screwdriver to turn those, what's going to happen is it's going to actually like chisel out a part of those. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I would recommend even using like a butter knife if you have to and yeah. I, and put it in long ways so that it actually makes contact with the whole thing. Right. Otherwise, you're looking at yeah, uh, you're going to make screw. chips in it and it's going to look ugly. Yeah. Not only will it look ugly, it will not be as functional, but that should that should go without saying. I mean, um, but don't be afraid to adjust your guitar. No, no, absolutely not. You can't screw it up unless you like tighten something down too too hard and it cracks or strips or but I've never seen anybody strip. I've seen people do strip truss rods, obviously myself, but I really haven't seen anybody do anything like, you know, like crack a, um, a bridge or something. Cause they tighten something down too much or. Right. So. Oh, I'm sure. Well, I'm you, sure you can. <laughs> you should have seen the strings on the PV when I took them off. No. Yeah. They did not know how to string those. So um, those who don't know Fender, Fender, um, the, the, what they call the, uh, what they call the. Oh, the I love it. When classic they put... Fender. Yeah. Uh, posts. Right. So in the old days, they didn't have a... Um, you stuck it into the tuner and then wrapped it around. Right. So you had to go past, cut it, stick it into the tuner, and then start winding. And that actually is like a, a locking tuner yeah. in a way. Because it, well, lock, it yeah, locks kinda. it in pretty well. Yeah. 
And kind of. um, it, well, if you listen to um, who's the Mike or Matt or whatever on the on the pedal show, he he's like, I have, oh, I've never oh, met. A, a, if you go oh, if you go, go if you make one rap over it first, it will act like a lock. Yeah. If you if you just rap underneath, which is what everybody does, guess what? That's yeah. not any better and, than a conventional tuner. And that's what the guy he was it, Mick. Is it Mick on the pedal yeah. show? He's like, yeah, that's what I do. I just, uh, I just, and I don't do the over because because Dan was saying he put, he does the over yeah. and under, and then Mick was telling him, oh no, you don't have to do that. It locks just as well. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. No, it no, doesn't. I've not had, really. I mean, obviously his guitar is is truly amazing, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing, as good as his. Um, uh, he's he's proven that over and over. Oh yeah, snobby little bastard. Um, anyway, um. But, but Dan, me, Dan, Dan admits that he has to be able to do that. And he goes, and, I, and Dan was very um, uh, diplomatic. He says, well, I guess I just do it out of habit. In other words, yeah, I'm not going your way. <laughs> well, yeah, so I, when I do, because um, I, I had a guitar with vintage, I actually had several guitars with the vintage style tuners. Yep. Um, I don't use the, I don't stick the thing in the hole. There's just a point. It's, it's no different. So I just lock them using yeah. uh, you know, over under. But, but the thing is, I, I, I don't use very much string around string. the post either no, no. any amount of wraps you add it's just it's slippage yeah. yeah now you're now yes you could cause it to bind in the nut or whatever but i mean honestly like the trade-off is i get better tuning stability because my my string is not slipping on the post so right so it going to the bridge it's not moving yeah um or on the nut yeah so uh yeah so maintenance on your guitars obviously um uh, watch your humidity. What what is that thing you've got, Dave? That you a uh, hygrometer. Have? A hygrometer. Get yourself a hygrometer. They're what twenty bucks. Uh, this one was yeah. It's like like you can get it for like ten bucks. I mean, they yeah. just order one on Amazon. Same day delivery. Put it up in your house on your refrigerator, and or where you keep your guitars in your house, and uh, it'll tell you the temperature and, and humidity usually. Yeah, I got to get one in this. I have one outside of the room door, and I should. Generally post. speaking, you want your guitars between fifty and sixty percent. Yep, that's what I've been told. And so, as on the East Coast, and I think you deal with this too, is we get a lot of humidity in the summer. Yeah, so, so, sometimes we do. Um, yeah, I mean, it's usually pretty typical in my house. But now, believe it or not, humidity to a point, humidity isn't as bad for guitars as it as the lack. Okay. Yeah, because you get a higher range between fifty and sixty percent than you do anywhere else. Because right. if you go above sixty, you're going to start having problems with the guitars becoming sort of waterlogged. Right. But below fifty, you're going to have problems. You actually want humidity. You like if right. you go below fifty, then you're going to have splitting and uh, shrinking fretboards and all kinds of craziness. So if you're the kind of person that takes the guitar to a um, a gig uh, and leaves it in the, the back sun. of the car all day that's not a good idea no no even no. The, people will tell you oh if you leave it in the case it's all right no it's not okay no it's not no it's not that's why did you think they make case humidity <laughs> and temperature sensors and stuff like that's not no i know no. i know i'm just like, i'm curious say that. That they're fucking it, like would you leave your dog in the car no well, that's just it no, but some of these people probably would, Jim, and that's why they need to be taken out back and beaten with a with a rubber hose until you know they can't see straight. We're taking um, your Les Pauls away, Mister. We're coming in. We're coming in with um, if there's child support services, there's there's Les Pauls. Guitar Protective Services, that's right? GPS. Guitar- <laughs> GPS. That's what GPS stands for. Guitar yes. Protective Services. Yeah, you thought it was a uh, geographic positioning system. <laughs> I'm here to take your guitars away. I'm sorry, sir. You try. You treated that guitar too badly, and you're not. You're not allowed to have it anymore. All right. So the next thing was, I was out grocery shopping, and David said to me, "We were talking about pawn shops." I had gone to a pawn shop. I had been, to a pawn shop. <laughs> and I went to a pawn shop. I saw a couple. You know, I mean, a couple nice things. They had an orange amp that looked pretty good. I just didn't want to drop that much money right now. Um, what was their price tag on it? That wasn't too bad. I don't remember. It was in the okay. Tuesday. All right, all right. Fair yeah, it was, it was pretty good. I could have flipped it. Let's just say that. And um, so let's talk a little bit about pawn shop etiquette. Because then Dave goes to me, he goes, yeah, what I used to do is go to the pawn I shop. I used to hang, hang out. out. 
I used to hang out in this local pawn shop. I'd go down there and I'd sit for a couple hours. <laughs> people would come in with things like if it was like a guitar or something i'd be like well whatever they're gonna give you i'll give you 10 percent more <laughs> and, and then like they take the deal you know so the the guys like at the pawn shop they finally kind of said yeah don't do that anymore <laughs> <laughs> well you couldn't have been taking away that much business uh no i mean i happened like once i think and they were like no don't do that again <laughs> in my area i think the most guitars i've seen at a pawn shop has been like eight Honestly, and oh shit, man! There's eight in my, in the, my local pawn shop every day. So I'm saying eight. That's it. That's all that's there. And it's like, uh, I'm like, what do they possibly take in? You know, on an average, one um, every few days. I mean, uh, most of these were were you know like your Laguna and your you know the stuff that obviously, yeah. Uh, it's always crap. Like every once in a while, you'll see something nice. Yep. I've seen Gibson Les Pauls go through before. Um, I saw an Epiphone Les Paul Studio, which I bought for ninety nine bucks, and they told me yep. it has a warp neck. Oh fucker, didn't have a warp neck. Yeah, I took it home. I did trust rod adjustment. Got playing real good. Played it for two or three years. Sold it to a friend of mine for ninety nine bucks, and uh, as far as I know, it still doesn't have a warp neck. So, see. Yeah. So um, I might get, um, I, I've been watching mine, uh, my local, uh, actually I have two local pawn shops and I've been watching to see if, if I get a, a decent Les Paul custom, Les, uh, uh, Epiphone Les Paul custom in there, or even I know that's a copy or something, I might grab it um, to uh, pull the pickups out and do something like you've done with Unicorn. Yeah, I mean. My I, problem is I, I can spot it. More trouble than they're worth. Yeah, I, I can spot a fake Gibson in a second. But I don't yeah. know if I could spot a fake Fender. We talked about that. Yeah, uh, and, you know, my, my estimation is most fake Fenders, like, you could tell them from a mile away. You can see, like, the logo is wrong or, like, it's the wrong logo for that guitar. It's the wrong size headstock. Uh, I've seen issues where the volume tone knobs are like in the wrong place. Um, I've seen, you know, pickups being slanted the wrong way in the big guard. Like I've seen weird stuff like that on, uh, on fakes, the it, a wrong bridge the the bridge is a dead giveaway on fenders. If it doesn't have rolled saddles, you know, and it's supposed to like, and, they, and it's got generic saddles on it. It's so one thing it's got graph tech that could be a replacement, but if it, but if it's just like, you know, some janky looking thing like you can usually tell pretty quickly uh actually i've seen truss rod or not truss rods uh the whammy bar that's like all messed up where it's like the wrong angle or it has a weird tip on it yeah. um that's that can be a giveaway that the um the neck plate on the back that's another thing you see commonly if it doesn't have the f on it's a newer model guitar like it's generally not going to be real unless you have to know your models like you could google it real quick and so like Jimmy Vaughn didn't have it has no F on it or anything. It's just a you know regular plate because that's what they were doing back in the fifties, which was what that's modeled on. Um right. so you just gotta kinda know a little bit more about them. I would recommend if if you're standing in a store and you're like, I'm not sure if this is real or fake, just Google it. Google the yep. serial number. It, and chances are if you Google the serial number, like you'll see it come up in a discussion post somewhere where somebody's like, Yeah, I've seen you know fakes using this serial number. Um, I've heard of that happening more than once where they just run a, you know, a whole bunch of fender alikes with the same serial number. That's, you know, faked off of some photos. Yeah. somewhere. So. Yeah. Because it's the easy way to sell it. I think that, um, uh, there, I know for a fact, I should say, I think I know for a fact that, uh, there is, there are several fake, uh, replicas of Keith Richards, Les Paul. Yeah. Yeah. That have been going around and they're really well done. The problem is they're You're talking about the Telecaster, not Les Paul, right? No, Les Paul. He did. Yeah, he, I, he I know they've been both have been fake. Yeah, um, it's a '50s Les Paul. I want to say it was a um, a junior. Um, yeah, it's something a, like that, right? I know what yeah. you're talking about. And they have the exact serial number. I mean, it, that I have heard of. Um, but if look, if they're faking, if they're out there faking uh, strings. And even budget strings now. 
You're talking about something that's only worth 10 bucks. What are the chances that they're out there faking the budget guitars, the Epiphones, the Le- the um, Squires? The I doubt it. There's no money in it for them. Like they- so I have a theory. Not most, the low end Squire. I'm not most, talking about Infinity and Bullet. I, I, I know. I know. Most of the crap that we see from these fake guitars are people ordering Chibsons online. That's what, what's driving that market because it's really, really hard to import anything right now made with wood. So for them, that's not a lucrative business. Now I'm not saying that they haven't done in the past, but like I would speculate that the vast majority of them are ordered by American people looking for a knockoff and then they go and throw them into the pawn shop or whatever later when they're hard up for money. And it's the same kind of people that would buy that to begin with. If you think about it, right. Like would end up pawning it. So, yeah. Well, you, we talked about that before there was a, um, there was something you and I talked about, like, um, you know, we talked about what I want to do in the future and it, and you said, well, if you walk in there with X guitar and Y amp versus, you know, yeah, yeah. A, you're going to have a different response instantaneously. Right. Which, which by the way, starts towards my next uh, discussion point. Um, where, so, um, well, iconic guitars in movies. So I was watching, uh, a reverb did this thing about 12 iconic guitars in movies. And I'm going to read real quick. Cause I made a quick list of the movies. It was Bill and Ted, Bill and Ted's excellent event. Steinbergers. Yep. So the future guitars were Steinbergers, which, yeah. And uh, the guy said, we're kind of going back in that direction. Yeah. So Um, there was walk hard, but, but okay. But before the Steinbergers, the two guitars that they were playing, which were supposedly fenders were actually knockoff. One was an Ibanez. Yeah. The other, I'm trying to think. um, Yeah. The the, uh, the blonde haired guy. I don't know if that's Bill or Ted. I honestly don't, I, I don't remember right now. But um, the blonde haired shorter guy was with, using something, yeah, that looked like a offset. That was a um, that was an Ibanez, and then the other guitar that that uh, Ken Al Reeves' character played was actually some budget knockoff, like under knockoff, yeah, thing, which is which is fine. Like I, I mean, but you, but you know what was called? You remember the damn Steinbergers? You know what was called? Yeah, yeah. it was called a Squire. But it had nothing to do with the Squire line, but it was yeah, called the yeah. Squire, which is funny. Then there was a Walk Hard. And so in the movie Walk Hard, um, they did uh, they did the guitars and um, they were talking like a about... Like Hummingbird or something? Yeah. And so the, the um, it, it was actually a songwriter. And okay. uh, the songwriter series. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the reason which, I laugh about it is because I'm like, that's the last movie where I would be like, oh, that's an iconic guitar because that movie. Yeah. No. And like that, that just seems like a really bad movie to include on this list, but okay. Well, no, it's not that it's an iconic guitar because of the movie, which I, I think that's what they were going towards. I think it's because, yeah, the, 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 like somebody goes into that movie and says, yeah, I want to play guitar as a result of that movie. Yeah. And right. That is being the movie that yeah. I walk out. The really with. dark period. <laughs> Wayne's world was on the list. So oh, the strat, the white strat, yeah, the white strat. But he was playing; he wasn't playing a strat. Uh, he had a Jackson in the second one, playing a, a yeah, and in the first one, he was playing um, a, a a knockoff as well. Yeah, and you know the funny thing is in the second one, uh, you can see his white strat in the background too. Yep, it's, he still has it. Like, yeah, yeah, the, the it's 60, in the back of the doll factory. But the <laughs> fact is, it was supposed to be a sixty. Well, in the movie, they kept saying it was a 64 Strat. It was actually a 62 Made in Japan replica. Knockoff. Of course. <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason, because when I get to the last one, there's a good reason that they use these knockoffs, people. Yeah. The, very good reason. Yeah, and, is, and it it the the movie, is it the one for the Quiet. Quiet. Of course it is. I don't even I talk. Know. Can we skip that one? Because I said, La like, Bamba. that's done. Overdone. So La Bamba. The um the guitars that uh, Richie Valens used in real life, they were able to get two of them. They were provided by Norm's Rare Guitars. Really? That's yep, cool. So they were real. And the what was, um, what was he playing? I don't even. 
Like um, it, it's like a it's not a wild cat, but it was like the wild cat, like the Epiphone wild cat. Yeah, like a okay, all right. It was like those. One seventy five kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it had that vibe. Um, and when he was playing with Buddy Holly, the the Strat that you see close up and um, on him and on Buddy Holly, the guess is they they're not one hundred percent sure on this. Um, the guess is because it was also given by Norm's guitar, or well, yeah. um, borrowed from Norm's guitar. It was a real period protect or uh, period correct Fender Stratocaster. Yeah. It was used in those scenes. Yeah. So that was that was pretty cool. Back to the Future. So uh, the three thirty five that didn't exist at the time that the, the ES three thirty five yeah. did not exist in nineteen fifty five. Didn't exist until yeah. fifty nine. That's a big. That's a big one. I thought that was funny because. Um, originally norm's rare guitar again is is uh and i don't think norm's rare guitar was norm's rare guitar yet it no. was just warm and he was running it out of his basement or whatever he was doing in his house because i know that that that's a pretty cool if you ever get a chance to listen to norm tell yeah story. i remember her reading that like that's how he actually started was like leasing guitars to movies and stuff yeah and and uh um what's his fit uh uh george harrison came i bought a couple guitars right. off of him, that's what kind of propelled him into that Anyway, so um, not during the not during the Beatles age, but not too long after. So um, anyway, Back to the Future that was the biggie. But what's the guitar he was playing in the beginning where he gets blown back? Uh, that oh god, that little yellow thing. Yeah. Um, the brand name escapes me, but yeah. those were like a thing, and you can still get those on reverb. Yeah, they're little travel guitars. Yeah, they were called. Yep, and and who's the uh, famous uh, blues rock musician that used one um, in real life? It I was uh, Billy Gibbons. Yeah, Billy Gibbons, yeah, was using one in real life. So the whole comedic purpose was to put this tiki little guitar yeah. on and have it blow him back. And then, okay, so what is he playing when he when he does the audition in front of? Um, uh, God, there's like a ton of guitars in that movie. Yeah, it's a blue What's, Kramer Beretta or something. Like it, I I know it's blue. It was an Ibanez. Yep. Oh, it's an Ibanez. Yeah, it was a. It was another Stratocaster knockoff Ibanez um, that uh, Super Strat type thing that he was playing in front of um, uh, Power Love Guy there. Yeah. Yeah. So then Crossroads, of course, Crossroads. Yeah. Several Telecasters in that movie. Several. Yeah. So one was period correct. One Norm's rare guitar gave was the one that supplied all of them. But only one was period correct. And that was the one for all the close-ups and for the, you know, for the thing. And then they had that custom Jackson for uh, Steve Vai at the end. That was a Jackson. That's right. I was going to ask you, was that a Charvel or Jackson? There is a Charvel in the shot. There's a Charvel sitting on a guitar stand in the background. Uh, He had that that Jackson. I guess they put out a bunch of, like, orders to different people. And Jackson was the one that got to him first. So there was their guitars in the movie. So that's the one it was. It, it, and it was up to debate. There was a lot of debate as to whether or not that was a Jackson or a Charvel. Yeah, nobody um, really knows. Well, I mean, you can see in the in the movie, it's clearly a Jackson. They put tape yeah. over it. Yep. But um, they put tape over the thing. Yeah. Uh, but it was a uh, uh, Machio was was holding mostly Fender Squire knockoff yeah. type guitars. But yeah. they weren't Squires back then. They were something. Purple Rain. A cloud guitar. The cloud guitar. This is when we were introduced to the cloud guitar. Can I tell, you, I, see, can I tell you a story about this? I gotta, yeah. I gotta make fun of a of a professional player, okay. a, a guitar player named Bernard Allison, who has gone around telling people like backstage and stuff that he create that that guitar was his custom signature guitar, that the cloud guitar was designed for him. Really? The guy's a fucking lying piece of shit. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> That was one that, so if you think about the period of time, um, I think Prince was 20-something, early 20s. And this was his first foray into doing his own signature design. And uh, so um, anyway, because uh, Prince, Prince is not that much older than I am. I want to say Prince was only a few years older because um, I remember seeing him uh, when he was 19. Uh, but anyway. Uh, that guitar, of course, he did play Strat or Telecasters in that movie as well. But that was the one that that was there. Okay, ready for the next movie? 
Yes, it's the hateful eight. The fucking stupid Martin that they smashed. So what happened was Kurt Russell walks in, and I don't know how they back in a few minutes, Jim. You go ahead and tell the story. No, it's it, it, this. This will not take that long. I fucking Kurt Russell walks out of the into the scene, picks the guitar up out of um, Jennifer Jason Lee's hands, smashes it against the wall, and it was Martin had given them a real eighteen hundreds era Martin. Yeah, and apparently, <laughs> and apparently they forgot to tell him that it wasn't the double guitar. And so the look on her face—that's what. So they showed the they showed the scene, right? And he yeah. smashed the guitar and they go, now listen to her reaction again. And you can see she's looking clearly at the at the director going, it just smashed the real thing. Because when it smashes, instead of her looking at him like she's fucked, she's looking over the director like, oh my God. <laughs> and All right. They- I want to point something out though. Like people have gotten pissed because they're like, oh, turn to could have prevented that or whatever. Listen, uh, the stupid part about it is that they use the shot in the movie and like people are people are bitching because they're like they use the shot. Look, they smashed a priceless guitar. If they didn't use that shot in the movie, that would have just been fucking terrible. Oh yeah, yeah, that would have been just stupid. But they used it in the movie. I think it's great. I think. Uh, and how many people, extra people, went to see it? I don't know. Is it paid for the guitar? But can no, you imagine how much priceless? That, yeah. Well, that's what people were pissed about. Is like it was the only of its kind left, and yep. uh, it's now ruined. So, yep. Which is why oh, you see more and more copies. Of CF <laughs> Martin has now said they will no longer loan guitars to films ever. Yeah. So. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I, they shouldn't have done it to begin with. So when we talk about that guitar, that was right into my next and final point that I wanted to talk to you tonight. Value of a guitar. We've talked about this before. And as I walked around Walmart the other day, and I was so glad to have David on the phone because I hate walking around Walmart all by myself. I tend That's to start a strange experience. I was in Portillo's. He was at Walmart. Yeah, he was. He was picking up walnuts or something. I don't know. He was. He was getting drive-through. I remember hearing cheeseburger and something else. And I was um, surprised. And I and so here I am. I'm like. Oh. Anyway, so I'm walking around Walmart, and and we're talking about this, and it and it dawns on me. I'm like. When people talk about fenders, they talk about the simplicity of a fender. A fender is, you know, a block of wood and a block of wood and some metal in it. And yet we're always like the custom shop fenders, even the elite series, it's $2,000 or well, $2,200 for a fender elite. I just, I don't get it. I get it with a carved top. I'm not saying that, that you should spend thousands of dollars on a guitar. I'm not saying that that should be it. When you talk about, carved tops and you start talking about the manual labor that goes into them and and uh, the artwork that goes into things and the picking of wood and stuff like that that goes into um some of these things just for artistic value let's face it after a certain amount of money and a certain amount of stuff every guitar gibson uh, prs whatever it it is about the oh the grades have to go a certain way but it just nothing that fender makes in my opinion is really Valuable. All right, I'm ready. I'm, I'm putting the glove, I'm putting the gloves on. Hit me. So I completely agree. No, I don't. Actually, um, <laughs> value in the industry is based on what people are willing to pay for something. And yes, so that's true. People are stupid enough to go spend two thousand dollars on a Stratocaster that is essentially the same thing as the you know thousand dollar standard i don't know what the standards are they don't have a standard anymore but they don't have a standard um if if you're willing to go buy a professional series at you know let's say they're 1200 right and then they have the the elites that are that are 2000 and what do you get so you get a compound radius on the elite and you get better pickups you get a nicer case oh these are fuck you think people really make their buying decisions based on the case only you jim um I don't. I'm just yes, saying. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Don't even give me that shit. You're I like, don't. I said, I was having a conversation with you with about some, some guitar, guitar the other day, and you're like, well, does it have a case? And I'm like, well, yeah, it does. And then you're like, and then you're like, well, but it's not a genuine case. And I'm like, who cares? Who cares? You're the only one who cares. Um, <laughs> no. So what I was, what I'm getting, what I'm getting at though is that that um, look. 
how much are better pickups going to cost you? Like if you, if you do the math, you say, okay, so if I'm going to get that compound radius and I'm going to get the regular state, you know, like a regular uh, compound radius neck versus a regular neck. And then I'm going to get, so what's that, got, what's that, what's does that upcharge cost you? Like in the back of your mind, what is that worth? Exactly. In my opinion, that's a $75 or a hundred. Right. $75 to $100. I, I, 150. I go as high as 150, but because it's a specialty thing, right? Um, and then the pickup thing is like, okay, so I could buy a, I, I could buy a whole set of Duncans for like 250 bucks. So it honestly, like, I think pay, t- paying a tw- taking twelve hundred dollar guitar and then getting those extra features and then calling it two thousand, you're being kind of silly to pay for that. Um, in in my opinion, now opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. Most of them stink, um, including mine. Uh, but ultimately, like I think there are better values if you're looking beyond the brand name. I think for Fender specifically, I think we pay a lot of their marketing costs. I think they build a lot of guitars that hang in shops. And I think they, that the popular lines have to pay for the ones that don't do so well. And so everything is marked up considerably. Um, I think you could probably build a Fender style guitar, CNC, compound radius, uh, decent pickups with labor and sell it for 1100 bucks or 1200 bucks and still make a profit. Yeah. I mean, if you look at any one of the, the fenders, um, I don't care if it's the offset, the strat, the telly, most of that work has got to be in the CNC. I yeah. mean, I know that I know that there is some figuring. Less on a telecaster. That's what really pisses me off. When you look at a twenty four hundred dollar telecaster, you think I know you see like the hand fit and finish thing. The CNC stuff is so good now. I don't know how much hand finished work goes on in a in a production guitar anymore. I really it's don't. Now, I know on things with carved tops, there's a lot. Um, I think most of your Fender guitars are pretty much all done CNC. The bodies are. There might be some hand work done on the necks to get them to play right and stuff. Yep. But ultimately, like we're in the day and age where the plaque is going to become commonplace. And every guitar that comes out of every factory is going to get plecked probably in the next decade. Uh, and once that happens, like your $350 guitar is going to play just as well as your, you know, $750. It happens guitar. more and more every day. Right. I mean, we right. hear about people, um, uh, and this isn't just the YouTubers. Um, this is the pros calling out how great the the um uh the modern vintage or whatever those the uh, vintage modern yeah vintage modern um uh on Fender is and how great a lot of the Epiphones play if they didn't have them ugly ass headstocks it'd be a whole lot easier to look at well, but if you if you've seen it's like if you watch the GNL video where they take you to the factory and they show you like the way that Leo came up came up with ways to do certain things Gibson has never been I've never looked at Gibson and been like you're innovative in the sense that you wanted to try and create a, a create an assembly line guitar right Fender did that okay so that's right. my that's my point like that's always been their target so right. if to be charging you know high-end gibson prices for what is essentially a stratocaster or a telecaster that's just, what I, yeah. it boggles my damn mind you know what i think they're you know why i think the elite series is too grand because the custom starts uh, the custom stop starts at 2500 because they have to bridge that gap they have to feel like they have to cover all the price points and there is some guy out there that'll buy it, but I'm I'm willing to bet that the professional series and the, or the not, not the well I guess it was the professional series or whatever, and that and now it's the uh, the elite. I'm willing to bet that those guitars don't sell as well as the standards anyway. That the bread and butter of what they produce is probably standards, or yeah. now the the what the professional series or what they're calling it now, um, the American professional. I'm willing to bet like probably seventy five percent of what they sell is either American professional or um, the player series, um, yeah. the player grade, whatever. And, and outside of those, like, you know, you, you get the guys buying the, the uh, J Mascus and those kinds of things like that happens. But I think there's enough guitar players that are just like more generic stock. They don't really care if it's a signature model or whatever, or if you're going to mod it or whatever. I, I still think that there's probably, a lot more guitars being sold in the, in the quote, standard models. Um, right. I mean, 
you know, I'm sitting here looking at a um, an elite, and yeah, there is some some artistic, but it doesn't look like it's hard artistic stuff. It still doesn't look like a CNC could have done most of the work. Um, it definitely the the new plate they put on there that's got that little. It, it, well, you're talking about the, the neck contour thing. Yeah, yeah, that can be CNC, and that whole it, thing is. Yeah, so it just doesn't look like there's that much work into it. And again, that's why I like. Eh. And you're right. I, I mean, when it comes to Gibson, they didn't really look for, and they don't really do an assembly line, not to the extent. I mean, um, Leo Fender was the Henry Ford of guitars. Exactly, exactly. And his guitars were way inexpensive for the time. Yes. And they've lost sight of that, which is kind of funny. I'm, I'm like, I still look at them and go, yeah, they're reasonably priced for what they are because they're professional level instruments, but, um, and they're a hell of a lot cheaper than Gibson. Uh, for for like a Les Paul standard or something like that, but right. but if you look at, let me ask you this: this this is the way I want to phrase this question. I have two thousand dollars to spend. Am right. I going to buy an Elite Series Stratocaster or am I going to buy a PRS CE? I'm going to tell you right now: my money goes for the CE all day long, and and it's not because the CE is a professional, you know, it's like a a, a premium guitar, which it is. Uh, over the fender, but it's more or less like the attention to detail and the fact that, yes, there's CNC used in the creation of this instrument, but there's a lot more hand finishing done and there's a lot fewer of them made, which means that the quality control should be better. Yep. Not to mention the fact that, you know, for, for that amount of money, I better get a flame top. Right. <laughs> you know. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, when you look at an, an elite guitar with a with a flat finish all white all blue all black i just i don't i i, I and i might be totally wrong so you know because i know you're and i'm not saying you're a fender fanboy, but you're more of a fender yeah college. like i gravitate towards bolt-on neck guitars that's you know right it's kind of where i come from and i i totally see your point and i i i, I do want to back up though because because i'm sounding like the old man here and and, and agree with you okay. value is not determined by what price they put on it. It's determined by whether you're willing to pay the price that's put on it. And the that's fact that they haven't issued price drops to those guitars tells you that they are producing the right amount of those guitars for the market. Yep. I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. That um, doesn't mean they're making any, <laughs> you know, and it could be one of those things where the models in the catalog, but they, they make three of them a year. <laughs> It'd be interesting to get a person that's in sales of guitars in uh, Fender, that's a Fender salesperson, to find out what the sales on the new Acoustic Sonics are. Um, There's, um, (laughs) I have a feeling if you are a Fender dealer right now, your Acoustic Sonics have already arrived. And, uh, you know, whether you wanted them to or not. (laughs) And um, now you are forced to sell those things. So that you can make back your money. And I have a feeling that a lot of dealers are going to be very unhappy about that situation. Yeah. I you know what? We talked about the acoustic sonic and I and we ruffled some feathers when we talked about it. We did get we did get some uh some people that some folks that reached out to us and were like, you guys are hating on it for no reason. And like honestly, and I I think I was told I, I was sounding like an old man. Um, I hate I do hate the acoustic sonic. I'm not, a, I'm not an apologist for that. That thing is a fucking joke. Um, uh-huh. the, the, the problem I have with the Acoustic Sonic is that it really has no purpose. Like it's, it, it, it doesn't know what it's trying to be. And if it had made a clear decision about, I'm going to do both of these things equally well, or I'm going to do, I'm going to do one of these things equally well, I would have liked it a lot better. But I feel like that it's just a big giant compromise. Um, the other thing is the Acoustic Sonic, uh, it, the the sales tactics and everything surrounding it, and how they're forcing it on people, and all of this. Look, Fender right now, and I and, and I'm going to be real for a minute. The only reason that Fender right now is making the money they are is because of P Dub, P Dubs. If you are in praise and worship circuit, there are so many people relying on Fender guitars right now. Um, it's it's a big deal, and and Fender likes as well. Um, but, but mostly I would say mostly Fender, like standard Fender guitars. And you'll see that the, 
acoustic is being aimed firmly at worship leaders. They got the they got the hipster aesthetic for the modern worship leader, and they're and they're nailing it. They're hammering it. They're hammering on it. And I think it's also marketed at women. I think they they and and this this goes to show you. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna put my feminist hat on here for a minute. They assume that all women fall into the the young like singer songwriter category. And they don't know, like they, they they don't seem to, they can't seem to wrap their head around the fact that there are Jody Trevetti's out there and that there are, you know, Nina Strauss's and stuff like women who actually play guitar and they, yeah. and, they and their focus is not to write like little, little folk ditties and like pop music. You know what I mean? It, yeah. That there, there is a more hardcore musician base there. And I think they're, I think they're aiming solely at the fact that like, we know women are buying guitars. We figure they're all like this. I don't think they've done enough market research to figure out how that really works yet. Um, I think also that um, for sales of guitars to women, I think Daisy Rock was a good, was a step in the right direction. Like let's make guitars that have bodies that are more designed for uh, women's bodies. And but I think it was wrong in the way they approached it. Like yeah, the marketing to look conven- well, trying to make them look conventional. And then they had like the Daisy, like the big friggin' giant day. Like seriously, uh, that's ridiculous. So I don't know who who focused, you know, focus grouped that, but you you, sh- you should be ashamed of yourself. Um, I think women want guitars that women want, and I yeah. think they should be asking them what they want instead of trying to decide on their own. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you, you look at uh, one of the first acoustic. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Jim, but I, I I wanted to get this out before you take over. One of the first acoustic videos I saw was of a female singer songwriter playing it. What does that tell you? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know that that's that's the the market, whether it's female or male. That's the market. Yes, I think that what I think that what Fender is still backwards in is thinking that a a guitar, any guitar, is male or female in its design. Exactly. That a woman just wants a a guitar, she doesn't want it built around her. Now, there are men with small hands. They ask the same question as a woman with small hands. Can I get a guitar for my smaller hands? Yeah. Can I get a guitar that fits my body? Can I get a guitar that doesn't weigh nine and a half pounds? These are all the questions, the same questions men are asking. They're not any different. Except that, you know, men aren't asking if the underwear of my bra is going to rub up against the, you know, I would hope, maybe men are, I don't know. I'm not getting in the middle of that. (laughs) I'm just saying, like, there are distinct differences between, between both of them. But I think there can be a common design that works for both. And they have to figure out what that is. And nobody's done it yet. Maybe wow. St. Vincent kind of got at it. Yeah, I, sure. I like the St. Vincent signature. I really do. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm not going to pay Ernie Ball prices. So, no. And I'm not, yeah, and I'm not getting the Sterling version. Yeah, if I'm getting one, I'm going, I'm going full bore. Okay. Uh, agreed. Going all out. Now, that all that said, um, when it comes to the... Uh, uh, that thing that, on the opposite of the spectrum, um, the new uh, Greg Cock design is made for bigger men. Yeah, it's made for bigger people. It is literally designed if you're really tall and yeah. And if, if Michael Jordan played bas- or played, I mean, he plays basketball. But if he played guitar, like th- that, might right. be the guitar he would be interested in. <laughs> exactly. So that makes sense. But he didn't say it was only for big men. He just said it was bigger people. Yeah, dude. When your nickname is Man Squatch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's pretty clear your guitar is for bigger people. <laughs> yeah, Squatch. Yeah, he he is a big dude. I mean, I think he said that they increased the body size all the way around by like like ten percent or something. Yeah, and then they and then they like made the neck like ten percent beefier. Like they literally just basically upsized it for him. Yeah, and it, and it was all because for him the the. um Desert Island guitar is a telly. And so he said, okay, my Desert Island guitar is a telly, but I wish it was bigger. Yep. Everything about it was bigger because yep. I'm a big dude, you know? 
Yeah. Or, I'm the exact opposite. He is more than one foot taller than me. Yeah, he's he's huge. He is huge. Like seeing him dwarf Paul Reed Smith the way he does is hilarious. I saw him getting coffee. That was kind of funny. Yeah. I see you guys drinking coffee together. And he, and literally like he's a clear like foot four inches over Paul. <laughs> oh my God. I think you're taller than Paul Reed Smith. I'm pretty close to his height, if not taller, because um when I when I saw him, you know, when I got to meet him, yeah, I, I was pretty sure. But I, I it, it's such a quick thing. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not you know. sizing somebody up that way that I was. Because that morning I was just like, dude, I was shell shocked. I'm sitting there at Gear Fest, like in the coffee shop. And I'm like, I, it's day two. It's like, I think it was like seven or eight in the morning. And I'm sitting there drinking a cup of coffee. And around me is like, you know. I see Paul Reed Smith and uh, and uh, Greg Cock in line to get coffee. Get coffee, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, where where am I? Like that was literally the thought I had in my head. Like, where on earth am I right now? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's just one of those things. You go, hmm. okay, <laughs> yeah. I just take it in stride, like no big deal. I am. I am I'm big. sure I met guitar players there that like I've heard them on record, and I didn't even know who they were. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I like, know. I wouldn't have known Tim Pierce if you poked me in the eye with him. Oh, yeah. He might have been there. Yeah. I mean, there were dudes I knew, like the ones I knew, I, you know, I knew, but there were other people walking around that were, there were like other people recognize him. And they're like, oh, Rishing Hayes. So, like, I don't even know who that guy is. Like, <laughs> and should I know who that is? Yeah. That's kind <laughs> of the, it's like, should I ask somebody who this dude is so, like, I can at least go get his record or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> I I like to be able to to do the same thing. So I um I'm looking forward to uh, June when we we're all together and kind of doing the same thing, and and then I can actually stand next to Paul Reed Smith and find out how tall I am. I know. Well, then you can sit sit in the coffee shop with me and just be like, with your eyes glazed over, like, where am I? Like, what is this place? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. How it's do like, I get a job here? <laughs> you know? Well, we talked to Steve Stein and we found out he's five two. I mean, it's like holy crap. Um, I hope I hope they get Mrs. Smith as a headliner this year. That would be pretty cool. Because it would be awesome to meet Mrs. Smith in person. Yes, it would. So I guess the I guess what we take from this is, and and this is always the thing that that um, people should remember: the market will bear what the market bears. When I was a when I was a kid, they had a thing called the Pet Rock, and they would sell them in stores, and these things would be like ten dollars, and it was a rock with a, pa- a face painted on. It was a rock with a fa- not a, not especially gifted I may, rock. I may or may not have a family member painting rocks right now. We yeah, the, the pet rock. Let me let me see if I can find out. Um, the the, uh, the pet He's rock talking was, about the fact that, that this is an object that doesn't really have value that people are applying value to it. Nineteen seventy five. So I was eleven years old. Yeah. So like this piece of foil right here. Like, what if I put this on eBay and somebody paid no. me like fifty bucks for it? This piece of foil is then worth fifty dollars, right? They came in. They came in a um, a box that had breathing holes. Yeah, like when you bought like a mouse yeah. or a, a, a small rodent. Yeah, like it was bottle. alive. Like, and uh, fucking so rock. Listen to this. <clears throat> they were four dollars. I was off. But here's the thing: he sold one point five million pet rocks at four dollars a piece. That's six million dollars in sales. Um, <laughs> in between <laughs> for the Christmas season of 1975 through um, February of 1976. So these things were incredible. We we talked about that. I I, I was telling you that that um uh and people listen, um there was a time when people were literally murdering each other to get cabbage patched off. Yeah, yeah. There, you do not know the things that people went through to get a cabbage patch doll. Yeah. Well, and that's the, <clears throat> you're, you're pointing out though that like the value of that is a human life. Like that is getting to the point where the value of the item is clearly not in line with what it's really worth. Exactly. And it happens. It happens. And, and maybe, maybe that's what's going on with Fender here, but at the same time, it's like, look, nobody's killing each other over, to, over getting a little eat strat. No. No, so, I'm just saying that that. <clears throat> so when you think about is something overvalued, tickle me Elmo, 
um, remember when the PlayStation first hit the, the yeah. market? I can remember people paying a thousand dollars for a PlayStation. Yeah. What? Yeah. Really? The place, it was at the the three. The people were yeah. paying a thousand bucks for it. Yeah, thousand dollars for the three. Oh, you remember when they said that that thing was going to last for like eight years, and then they killed it six years later? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. You know, it, it, so the value is always what people will put on it. And, and yeah, there, there were, I, I went to the extreme when I was talking about what people were willing to kill to get. Well, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think that is an extreme. I think that that's an, an illustration of when people have placed the value for something so high that it's like, it's just insanity at that point. Like, it's not really worth that where no. it's, it's purely speculative. Right. Um, I don't think. Fender, anything that Fender's doing right now is purely speculative. Honestly, what I think is going on is we're paying for their marketing. Yep. We are paying for their um for them to produce a, an abnormally large amount of guitars than what is actually sold in a given year. Yep. And to give their dealers leeway to make deals occasionally. Like I think that's what we're paying for. I don't think we're paying for what a guitar is actually worth from them. And that's that's the bottom line. Like I, I stick to that. Um, yeah. I don't think it's true of any company. I think all the companies build a little overhead f- to cover their own costs and their own ass. Um, if something goes wrong during production, it's the idea of like, you know, just covering all the bases. Uh, and of course, every company has some sort of marketing. I think you get better deals when you look for the companies that have very little marketing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, if that, if that why- helps. We ask that question every time it comes around to like, oh, look at this. They're, they're making a guitar in America. This person is making um, uh, custom guitars in America for, say, like what, what we're talking about with uh, Kiesel. Yeah, yeah. Kiesel does not have the marketing machine or the distribution um, machine that, that gives We have him- a few minutes left. Can we talk about Kiesel? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right. Oh, go ahead. That's, so, it. That's exactly what I wanted to get to. Go ahead. So Kiesel un, uh, announced a couple new models um, at uh, NAM. They announced the Delos. And the Delos is I, it's very strictly similar to the Greg Howe model that they already do. Um, but the Delos is interesting because it's clearly aimed at the Sir guys. Like, it is a recessed tremolo with two post locking tuners. Uh, you can get a six or seven string model, uh, humbuckers, single coils, pick guard. Uh, I think, I don't know if you can get it without a pick guard. Um, and it, you know, of course you can get your flame tops and all that stuff, or you can go solid color, uh, as usual variety of wood choices for, from, uh, Kiesel. Um, but what's interesting about this guitar is if you look at the base price, this guitar is like $1,100. Okay, for a USA made circular. Yep. And the funny part about it is how much is the Ibanez equivalent? The S series or the S what no way the uh the A Z series. The A Z series are seventeen, I think they're sixteen and seventeen hundred dollars for yep. the Indonesian models. And, right. And they're being made overseas. Let me look them up because I want to make sure. And they're being made in a factory of, you know. I'm not saying that that diesel doesn't use factory. It, not they're not made in the states. That's that's for one thing, and you don't get any wood choice. You don't get any of that stuff. No. And I was I was like, I figured they were going to be fifteen hundred bucks to start, right? And I looked the other day on Kiesel's website. I was like, dude, they're eleven hundred dollars to start. So to get to get a prestige AZ, you're looking at two thousand, two thousand, right? Yep. To get a normal, oh, they got new colors this year too, by the way. Um. Mm-hmm. To get a normal, where they're they're uh, all the ones I'm seeing are prestige, premium, it's thirteen hundred. So for a hundred for two hundred dollars less, now you're not going to get a flame top or anything like that, but you can get bay make bay make uh, bay make maple bay pole neck <laughs> and all of that good stuff. Um, I actually would rather have it not bake. Um, but you can. I mean, I could go to I could honestly go right now and I could order like a bare bones configuration of that guitar and I'd be I'd be fine with it. Yeah. Um, so my point is that they're they're producing a very similar guitar at a at a really affordable price. Yeah. Uh, in, in the states, in right? the United States, 
So here's what here's what gets me. If Kiesel can sell one of those for twelve hundred bucks, right? And we're talking about a flat color, you know, on par with a prestige model from from Ibanez. How much overhead is involved in Fender, who charges twelve hundred dollars or not twelve two thousand dollars for a uh, an elite series? Right. Think about that for a minute. That's insane. And there's an eight hundred dollar price difference, and you basically get no choices from Fender. No, no, you don't. I mean, you get to go into the store and see what they've got. Yeah, they, but I mean, that's as far as it gets. I mean, catalog, well, know. and that's the thing. Like even Ibanez, like these AZs, you can't play them in stores. Nobody's stocking the damn thing. Oh. Yep. So you're just gonna buy sight unseen and hope it's good. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cross your fingers. Yeah. So I don't. I mean, honestly, like when it comes time for another guitar, it, I'll have to have a hard look at the Delos because. I could see myself getting into a Sir style guitar, but, but I wouldn't go ostentatious with it for obvious reasons. Cause you can, you can definitely take an $1,100 guitar from them and make it a $3,000 guitar really easily. Um, I, if, if I'm staying close to the ground, it might, it might work out for me. And I know everybody's like screaming at their computer, right? Like you could get the same thing from it, from GNL. Not really. I mean, um, you can get, so you can't get a recessed tremolo, which is which is a big feature in in my mind. Uh, everything else you can pretty much get. You can get like a, a hum single single or a hum hum. Um, yep. You can get maple, you know, maple on maple. You can get exotic woods. You can get all that stuff from Janelle, but the price is going to be more. Um, you get resale value from Janelle. I mean, more than yeah, they're probably about on par. To be honest with you. Yeah, with the pedal. I don't know. It'll it, it'll be an interesting conversation when it comes to that, because uh, more and more I'm thinking, like long term, I'd like to have a dual humbucker strat for certain stuff. So, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's something that uh, that I've thought about um, <coughs> when I was at Guitar Center waiting to get this. Um, the guy in front of me uh, had. It, he is in another band locally, and he was talking about the fact that he plays an HSS Strat. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I would be fine with HS Strat. So, like yeah. a humbucker and a bridge, and then a, a single coil in the neck with no middle. Yeah, don't need a middle. Don't. I honestly don't need a middle. Really? Nope. Nope. I, Jim, I'm not afraid of hum. <laughs> okay, um, I'm not one of the Strat guys. that's like, well, I got to put it in the in between position because otherwise it hums. I got to put it on the in-between position because otherwise it's thin or because otherwise it's not thin enough. It doesn't sound like it's coming out of my ass. <laughs> I really, I, I honestly, in you know, my opinion, a strat is already thin enough. Just my, just my take. on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm like, all right. So hang on, hang on. I'm going to, I'm going to demonstrate to you what that sounds like through, uh, through distortion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, ripping paper. Okay. Um, and I do, I do like, I do like the bridge and, and neck position on the, on uh, my S500s because they have the expander switch. I do like middle neck occasionally for playing like clean, clean rhythm stuff. Yeah. But these people that are all into bridge middle, like what on, what on earth are you smoking? Like you could completely eliminate that from my pickup selector. I, I wouldn't care. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of like Ingve, you know, I just disconnect the metal pickup. Like yeah, I'd be completely fine. It wouldn't bother me at all. I've actually thought about getting a pair of S 500 pickups and putting them in a strat with no middle position. Yeah. <laughs> just because like people would look at you like you're nuts. Yeah. You're bananas. Yeah. I don't need that. middle position. What the hell is that for? Exactly. All you need is all you need is lead and rhythm. Come on. I, you're not going to get any argument from me. Who is the <laughs> who is the musician that they, they're like? Oh yeah, I use my middle pickup all the time in Strat. Uh, famous musician? I, I can't. Remember. I don't know. I don't know of anyone who does. I read about it. <laughs> ah, whatever, whatever. I mean, I, I'm sure people do. Like, I know Stevie Ray used the middle quite a bit. I just I think it's so honky. Like mm -hmm. it. I mean, uh, let's just put it this way. I mean. 
I if I wanted a cocked wah sound, I turn my wah on and cock it. Yeah, or yeah. find a cocked wah pedal. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing about that. You know, uh, maybe maybe like maybe I need to explore more, like rolling the tone knob off and then putting it on the bridge in the middle, and yeah. seeing if like there's some merit to the fact that then then it's like the tone is kind of less shrill. But I, I know I know um, Robin Trower does it, and he plays a lot of stuff that way. And that's kind of funny because he's a guy that I really like his sound, but man, I cannot jive playing those songs with that pickup position. I just cannot. <laughs> I'm putting it straight to the bridge. Like the hell with this. Yeah. All right. Well, we're we're hitting two hours. We're at an hour and fifty minutes or something like that. We're we're getting there. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap us up, Jim. If okay. anybody had, do, do we want to put an audience participation thing out there? Like, do we have anything we'd like to ask the audience? Or, uh, well, there's a lot of different things. Um, that we, you know, I'd love to ask the audience when it comes to values on guitar. What is the what is the most valuable thing that you? Yeah, what's the thing you're willing to pay the most for from a guitar? That's and a idea. and let's ask the audience this. When it comes to multiple effects, would you be more warm to getting a multi effect pedal if the expectation of the multi effects pedal was that it was kind of like a um, a reverb setup, like a Strymon reverb yeah. pedal thing, or the, the the Boss DD or whatever, the delay pedal and all that thing, all that in a single box, or are you One willing, everything. right? to try to give it some dirt and see what comes of that. All I right. I'm, That's good I'm interested to hear some responses. So uh, post your, uh, post your comments in the group. And if you uh, are listening to us for the first time, I think our bumper is uh, still currently the great lakes guitar pickups bumper. Uh, yeah. I just want to remind people we have a Facebook group. Uh, don't forget to, you know, put up some uh, uh, reviews for us on iTunes or wherever you found our podcast. And uh Congratulations to John Bott for winning. Oh last yeah. Year. Congratulations, John Bott for winning the pickups. Um, yeah. And then I got these here. I got to get these installed this week. I'm, I, this is my goal for the week. I have not had a chance to sit down. And do it. So I've got three single coils. They're going up soon. And then you guys can win them. Um, yeah. Tell your friends, get them involved, uh, get them to join the Facebook group and get them to uh, listen to for, for, you know, the rules and all that. So, yeah. um, we have an Instagram account now. We have uh, Twitter. We have you can you can search us. You'll find us on there. Uh, Google. You can find us. You know through very uh, a plethora of ways now, and yeah. uh, we look forward to hearing from you. So um, that being said, tonight I've been David. I've been Jim, and we have been the Practical Guitarists. Absolutely. Yep.